38 uh, years ago when I was uh, on the faculty of the American University in Washington, I used to teach a course on the systems approach to use mathematical tools to analyze the power in those days of the power of the presidency versus the, uh, the other two party uh, to, the, to, this, to this collectivity of, uh, of, of federal government, the president had over 90% of the power, the real power, in, in any mathematical mechanism you could ana analyze for, uh, for control. So I support your, your analysis that the presidency is, is uh, darned important and the other 10% is important as well, but it's still the presidency. The question, however, I wanted to ask you is, there is another issue that's been lost once the 10th Amendment fell and then the 9th Amendment. We've had a restructuring, especially since the Civil War, of, uh, of the relationship between, of course, the states, the United States of America, and the United State of America, which is what we've become. And obviously, it's still the United States. We just didn't cross the S out of it to turn it into the United States. It saved on a lot of printing costs. Isn't that the original check and balance that was designed to work, not the presidency necessarily versus the two houses at the federal level, but rather the state versus the federal level? I'd love to hear a comment on that. Yeah, actually, I think you're right. I think the founders uh, intended uh, the states to be uh, very powerful in the system. And of course, you know, the, the spending has, if you just go by spending, which is not the only indicator, but it's a, it's a thumbnail uh, indicator. You know, the spending used to the state, the spending of all the states together used to exceed federal spending by a lot. And now, of course, it, it's just the opposite. You have, what, 13 percent state spending, and now we're over 26 percent of GDP on federal spending. And so, it, yeah, so the states have been uh, diminished. Uh, and that's just one indicator of how the states have been diminished. So I think, yes, yeah, so that was one thing that the founders wanted. And of course, at the federal government, it's very clear that the founders thought that the Congress ought to be the dominant branch. Article One listed all these enumerated powers. But I think that the, if you read the Constitution, certainly the states, the states and, the, and, and of course, Congress represents the states at the federal level. And originally, uh, until the early 1900s, the states uh, selected their senators. So. Uh, now, of course, they're done by direct election. So you see all that uh, was wired to the, and, and of course, the, the, to every state gets two senators, right, no matter what the, so you see all these things embedded in the Constitution where the states were supposed to have, and it was either, uh, it was really unclear before the Civil War whether it was a federation or a confederation, because they didn't really label it as such, and of course, that's what the Civil War was about, essentially. So, uh, in addition to uh, you know, slavery was a manifestation of that, but it was certainly a states, uh, states versus, uh, what, you know, what type of a, uh, a system do we have? Could we hear Andy? Is it possible for Andy to come in? Um, sure. I, I <clears throat> one thing I would add to that is that what protected the system of federalism in the pre Civil War period, I mean, uh, let me back up. One of the things that Ivan's book really raises, I think, beautifully is the fact that you have all of these guys like Monroe and Madison who write beautifully about the need to have limited government, and then once they're in office, <laughs> right, so he, he actually fudges. Um, I, it's terrible of me to say this, but he cheats. And he says, I'm going to rate Madison a little bit higher because he did such a great job in, you know, working on the Constitution. Well, this is about being president. Um, but the point is that, that and, and that was the purpose of my title, right, is good government, good politics. But I think from early on we see that, that it, is an, it, it is clear that limited government is not necessarily politically successful. And what I was going to say is that the advocates of um, federalism in the early period, this, this is not entirely true, but for much of the um, pre-Civil War period, those guys were slaveholders. Right? And, and part of the reason that the popularity of federalism went away is that once slavery was no longer an issue, and particularly, as, as Ivan points out, once northern um, politicians decided they really didn't have the stomach to pursue complete racial equality in the South and let the South impose a system of apartheid, um, southerners and, and other people didn't care a lot about federalism. And they saw the federal government as a way to get stuff. Okay? And, and they had been trying to do this throughout the early part of the 19th century, but they had been blocked. There were all kinds of bills to get money for internal improvements and things like that. 
these bills were blocked, and they were often blocked by Southerners. <coughs> After the Civil War, the Southerners' interest in protecting the federal system went away. So I, I think the story is more complicated, right? It's not just that um, this wicked federal government was imposed on it. It's like the <coughs> old cartoon from Pogo, right? We have met the enemy and he is us. Or Parliament of Horrors by P.J. O'Rourke. Should be the third book on your list. <laughs> <laughs> uh, neither of you said anything uh, tonight about the third branch of government, namely the judiciary. Maybe that's another evening, but uh, maybe both of you could comment on whether you think the third branch has been derelict in its duties or has overextended itself. Well, I think it has overextended itself, and it rarely, the Supreme Court rarely stands up for the original what the founders would have wanted it to, you know, rule in favor of the con original intent of the Constitution. So uh, we've, they've read so many things into the Constitution. One of the problems with our system of government is the founders, in my view, made it too hard to amend the Constitution. So what you do is people just kind of amend it on the fly with legislation, with Supreme Court uh, rulings uh, a lot of the time, and they don't go through the formal uh, amendment process. It's been, it's been fairly rare. And so you, uh, the, the Supreme Court has acted to uh, expand government. Uh, you know, an example of that was the court packing under FDR. I mean, he threatened the court with their, you know, uh, existence, so to speak, or at least their <coughs> existence as they knew it. And of course, they rolled over. They were ruling. Uh, and in fact, in one labor case uh, before that, they ruled one way. And on a, almost a similar case after he did this, they they ruled the opposite way and of course they after that it was uh, off to the races so I think uh, the Supreme Court hasn't been very effective in defending the Constitution uh, over its uh, over the course of uh, US history um, yeah I actually want to it, it turns out that story that Ivan just told you although it's very popular is not quite right um, <laughs> No, no, no. There's a, there's a beautiful little book that I reviewed for the Independent Review um, where the guy points out that the vote in that labor case was actually taken six weeks before the court packing plan was announced. So there were a variety of reasons why the court rolled over. That said, Ivan is absolutely right about this. Um, the court has rolled over. The most shameless example of this is actually the last of the Japanese internment cases, which nobody ever reads where the, um, right, so they'd lock the Japanese up, put them in these camps in Eastern, Cal in Eastern California and Eastern Washington. And what this, this woman named um, Mitsuka Endo sued, and she said she had a constitutional right to be let go free because there'd been no um, attempt to prove that she was actually dangerous to the United States. And the court said you should go free, but not because you have a constitutional right to do this. You should go free because uh, it turns out that Congress and the President never authorized the Army to lock up the Japanese. <coughs> and they didn't know this was being done. And the dissent, there are concurrences in this, and they say this is the most shameless case we've ever decided. Right? Of course Congress knew what was going on. Of course they authorized it. Um, but this is a perfect example. And of, co of course the court was dominated by Roosevelt appointees. What were they going to do? Say the president has, you know, trampled on the civil rights of these people? So, no, I, th I think Ivan is actually very right. But I think that's because the courts are dependent. Again, I would argue that's what you'd expect in a system where, especially when Congress and the president are united, right, they have stood up in situations where there's division. Um, when Truman nationalized the steel mills and Congress didn't go with it, um, the court said you can't do that. Could I in, um, inject a question? Since both of you gentlemen have degrees in economics, um, aren't we really talking about a, an issue of so-called moral hazard as a legislature and, and as a legislator? In other words, you have moral hazard to take on certain decisions, and you shift that and those areas that are ones in which you have essentially turf to protect you are going to be more likely to take a stand. And so you have this tragedy of a commons dilemma in a legislature, and you have a competition over what that would be, and the same with the presidency. In other words, you have this commons, this government commons, and the incentives that are created within that. Would that be part of what 
Oh Are yeah, no, about? I think yeah. this is, uh, that's what I said, is good government, good politics. Right. And I, I think that we often forget that politics has its own logic, particularly electoral politics. Mr. Eland, I wonder if you'd uh, give us some idea of how you rank the presidents and then justify, let's say, the first 10 and some glaring omissions that you might have ha had that uh, you would justify. Yeah. Um, well, my top 10 are very obscure characters indeed. Um, John Tyler's first, Grover Cleveland's second, uh, Martin Van Buren's third, Rutherford B. Hayes's fourth, Chester Arthur's fifth. Geez, I can't remember who I rank sixth. Harding. But, uh, Harding, Harding yeah. yeah. Harding, who everyone thinks is the worst president, I think he's uh, uh, much better. Even he said he was a bad president, but I think he wasn't, he, he, he uh, didn't do himself justice. Um, George Washington, I think, was uh, seventh. Carter was eighth. Eisenhower was ninth. And uh, Calvin Coolidge was tenth, I think. So there, I think I got all ten mm -hmm. of them there. Right. And, and the reason I ranked them that way is because they really uh, sort of embodied, no matter what era they were in, of. Um, trying to uh, limit government, uh, limit uh, foreign involvement overseas, and uh, really uh, at least trying to move us back to what the founders uh, wanted to create um, rather than moving us the other way. And of course, none of them were perfect. There's, uh, you won't find uh, a perfect president among them, but I think uh, they were there for limited government, a limited uh, restrained executive, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, they were more peaceful presidents than the other ones. One thing I should mention um, is that the way Ivan approached the book was not to say, okay, this president is doing this amount of bad things and this president is doing this amount of bad things because the government is bigger, hence the previous one is better. What he did, in, because it makes it difficult between, say, the 19th and the 20th century. Instead, what he did is the idea was that a president comes into office, there's X policies that exist, why things happen, does he increase peace, prosperity, and liberty, or does he decrease it? And that, that's right. And, right. and an economist would say you're looking at the marginal right. effect of each president. Exactly. So could you pick like two or three of the top ten and just explain, for example, like maybe Tyler and Carter? Carter would be a good example, or Van Buren or something, or Cleveland. Yeah, well, I think uh, particularly conservatives ought to like Jimmy Carter better than they do, because I think uh, if Nixon was the last liberal president, which I do believe he was policy-wise, and very similar to LBJ, um, Carter uh, started going back the other way, and uh, uh, he deregulated four industries, uh, communications, uh, finance, financial, uh, transportation, and... Uh, Forgetting the last one, um, I mentioned in my talk. Anyway, um, and also he did one Im very important thing. He appointed Paul Volcker as as chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, and Paul Volcker instituted tight money monetary policies and was basically responsible, I think, for the Reagan prosperity. I think Re Ronald Reagan had very little to do with it because Ronald Reagan. Uh, did much what George Bush did and, uh, and the Republican Party always does, and that is they enact fake tax cuts. If you don't cut spending, your tax cut is fake because you either have to raise taxes, as Reagan did later, or you have to borrow a bunch of money and run big deficits, which Ronald Reagan did later, or you have to print money. And so Paul Volcker uh, ran this tight money m monetary policy, and uh, uh, that was good, and also Greenspan uh, imitated him for a while, which was uh, responsible for the Clinton prosperity, because uh, I think Clinton probably had very, probably less to do with that than the mo than the monetary policy. But uh, of course, Greenspan then, uh, after the dot com uh, bust, he. Uh, reversed the policy, started increasing the money supply, and of course all that money then went into real estate and we had the real estate bubble, which has now burst. So uh, you see this chain of events. Uh, Carter also uh, uh, was one of the uh, presidents w who did not get involved uh, in many overseas conflicts at all. His only uh, overseas uh, adventure was trying to rescue the hostages from Iran, which was a failure. But he uh, he gave back the Panama Canal to, to the Panamanians, uh, reversing uh, that colonial uh, 
episode. And I think, uh, you know, compared to uh, uh, Reagan, uh, who who's, has this reputation of uh, being a small government person, which is, uh, he actually raised uh, federal uh, spending as a proportion of GDP, Carter and Clinton were the, the presidents to actually reduce that. Now, there, of course, there were other factors in there. The economy was going well uh, during that, but the economy was going well during Reagan as well. So I think uh, sometimes things are not what they appear. Eisenhower is the best at reducing um, uh, spending as a proportion of GDP uh, for the Republicans, but he held it level. So Carter and Clinton both bested him on that one. So I think uh, Carter has a lot to be said for him. And uh, he, he, he went, uh, he started going back the other way from uh, the uh, over-regulation. And, and in fact, uh, I think his re deregulation was more significant than Reagan's. Reagan did get credit for uh, continuing some of that, but he sort of attenuated his deregulation. And of course, Reagan, uh, Reagan had the Iran-Contra uh, affair, which I think was uh, worse than Watergate because it really cut to the heart of the Constitution. Uh, uh, um, and, I, and this is where I, I d disagree a little bit with Andrew because I think Congress has two two major, it has a lot of powers in the Constitution, but the two big ones are declaring war and uh, making decisions on federal spending. And of course, uh, what Ronald Reagan did was uh, secretly go behind Congress's back and rip that uh, page out of the Constitution. So uh, I think, uh, but Reagan was sort of a to some extent, he was a continuation of what Carter had already started with deregulation and that sort of thing. So I, I ranked Jimmy Carter uh, the best of the modern presidents with Eisenhower uh, close behind. What about um, Tyler and uh, Well, to John Tyler, um, he was a Whig, and the Whigs were the big government party, which was the precursor to the Republican uh, Party, which was the, uh, the, uh, the big government party. In the, de in the 19th century, the Democrats were the small government party. But um, uh, strangely, John Tyler, who was really, the only reason he became a Whig, and many Whigs were, uh, became Whigs for this reason, was to oppose Andrew Jackson because they thought he'd become a, a tyrant and uh, had excessive power. Uh, and so he wasn't really a Whig, he was more of a Democrat. And uh, he got in and he refused to, uh, he was vetoing, um, improvement projects, which we would call pork projects today. Uh, he, he, got, he, um, he settled the largest Indian war in U.S. history, the Second Seminole War, by uh, letting the Indians remain on their reservation instead of kicking them off the land that the federal government had promised them, which, you know, it, it seems like uh, you shouldn't get that much credit for doing that, but that you know, that constantly the Indians were kicked off land that they had been promised, and he, he settled the war. Uh, he also uh, uh, kept us out of a couple other uh, skirmishes. And so I think oftentimes presidents are not given credit for staying out of war. Like, who remembers that Ulysses S. Grant and Grover Cleveland, who's another favorite president of mine, uh, declined to get into a war with Spain over Cuba? Of course, William McKinley came along and did the opposite. So uh, I rank McKinley fairly low uh, because if, the, if two other presidents could have avoided this, he probably could have too. So I think, uh, I think uh, Tyler ranks very highly because he was for limited government and he was uh, so much for limited government that uh, he was almost impeached by his own party. And they didn't ask him back for another renomination for the, for the uh, presidency. So. Um, uh, he really uh, stuck up for his principles, and uh, uh, so many of the presidents I rank um, highly uh, didn't serve two terms. Well, I was just going to say that uh, one of the really nice things about this book is the way it's written, you can do that, where you look at what, I mean, the way I read it when I first got it, is I looked at the list and I said, how could that be? And then I would flip to these guys and, and read what, because um, they're very nice little narratives for each president. Um, and as I said, that, because your reaction has to be, what is Carter doing up there? <laughs> right? And, and the way it's written, it's very nice. I mean, it's much nicer to have Ivan here where you can ask him. Maybe you could call him up. But I think the book really, I mean, that's one of the nice ways to read the book. 
You've discussed the three branches of government, but it seems to me in, in modern, this last election especially, um, there was a fourth branch, which was the uh, media. And I wonder if you would comment. <laughs> uh, well, um, you know, the me I think it's the media allows presidents, if they're good at it, and most of our modern presidents have been at least fairly good at the media, some spectacular, like John F. Kennedy, Reagan, and Clinton to, to a large extent, have been uh, succe successful media personalities. And um, even George Bush, he, uh, you know, he couldn't put two sentences together and, you know, fumble his words, but the modern president can manipulate the media. Uh, and of course, the media went completely along with the fiasco in Iraq. Uh, no one said anything. And of course, it was obvious to many people in Washington that this was going to be a disaster, but no one really wanted to speak up. And of course, the media didn't want to be uh, portrayed as unpatriotic. So uh, the manipulation of the media um, is very um, pronounced nowadays. And I think you have 24 7 um, news coverage. So <coughs> things are really. Um, really go at a fast pace but the you know of course if the president is telegenic and he can get his message across you know he can he can do a lot the bully pulpit that uh, McKinley actually started not Teddy Roosevelt where he went around the country because in the 19th century presidents really it was taboo for them to address the public now we think that's that's kind of strange now but they would address the public on ceremonial occasions, but William McKinley went out and actually said, hey, wow, I can go over Congress's head if I go around the country and sell my policies, and then that'll put pressure on the representatives and senators to vote my way. Well, of course, Theodore Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson then started doing this, and now we're up to the modern thing where the president just gets prime time coverage or has a State of the Union, and it's fl he doesn't even have to travel around, really. He does because he likes the great photo ops. So. So it's, 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 um, it helps the presidency and expands the power because it's difficult for the media to focus on 535 members of Congress. But they'll tell you what the president's dog's name is or what he's having for breakfast. And some of this stuff, you're just going like, well, who cares? But you know, people really do care because the president's a celebrity and he, he, we don't have a king. So he, he also serves the head of state role as well. So, Certainly, I think the media has added to executive power um, because uh, the and, and that one other factor I think you know when the president kicks the New York Times correspondent off his presidential plane for writing a bad story, uh, access is everything in Washington. If you get kicked off the president's plane because you get too far away from his policies, of course you don't have anything to write and your career goes down the tubes and so uh, the president has access to so much information that Congress doesn't have and Congress struggles to try to get uh, this information and so does the media and if they're in good with the executive they can do so. So I think the president's control of the media is, is, has actually enhanced uh, um, executive power compared to uh, Congress. Amen. Most uh, chief executives have a very substantial agenda they really believe strongly in. And you've illustrated they have enormous power to put that agenda forth. And I, I'm hearing that a more selflessness might be needed in these chief executives. But how do you motivate a chief executive, especially when he really believes in his agenda, thinks he has hidden gems that are going to benefit mankind for generations? How do you motivate a chief executive like that to engage in selflessness? Well, first of all, I think selfless behavior is especially dangerous because, uh, you know, a lot of it is sort of twisted logic. And I think, you know, the founders were very smart in that they knew that people behave like they behave. And whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, when you get in office, uh, and certainly Jefferson Pru is the, is the, is the uh, prime example of this, he was for um, limited government, uh, restrained executive, and then of course when he got in, he started wielding, he was a very, one of the few strong exec executives of the 19th century, because Congress was dominant in the 19th century. And um, so uh, I think you have to have a government with checks and balances. And I think 
this is where Andrew and I differ a little bit because of those two powers, the war and the budget, of course, declaring war after Truman didn't declare war during K Korea, that's completely gone away, or almost. I mean, the two Bushes got congressional resolutions, which is not a declaration for both Iraq wars, but they did it, they said, they made, uh, they specified, well, we could take the country to war, we're just doing this as a courtesy. They both said that. And so, you know, that's where we're at in the war power. The budget, um, the budget uh, was unified. We, up until Polk, we had no unified budget. In other words, the president, now we all take for granted that the president presents his budget. And Congress, and I, I agree with Andrew, Congress is still there, and Congress had some effect on Clinton, but Clinton was already reducing the deficit before the Republican Congress came along, but the Republicans uh, helped in that. So divided government is probably best, but, but, uh, um, but we all take for granted that the president submits this budget and then Congress whittles around at the edges because it's a massive do uh, uh, document that's put together by all these eight huge agencies. And Congress has a few, sta each congressman or senator has a few staff members and then they have some committee staffs, but the, the, the amount of people that Congress has is um, miniature compared to the, to the um, uh, executive branch. So you have this uh, uh, unified executive budget which Polk uh, created and then it went away. Taft tried to bring it back and he couldn't. And then Harding, who actually, other than that, I rate him as a highly good president, but what happened before was the Congress and the, the commi each committee, like the Agriculture Committee, would negotiate with the Agriculture Department over the budget. And the President really didn't have that much power involved in it. But now that we have a unified budget, the, the President, uh, it's kind of a, the President submits the budget. And that's what his priorities are. Uh, you can, all the rhetoric aside, but it's very difficult for the President to, uh, for the Congress to, to do anything much with that. They, they just can affect it on the margins. One or two issues they'll debate, but the rest usually sails through. So they make marginal changes. So I think um, that, uh, and it's very important that the Congress's authority over the budget has been eroded over time, and that's uh, its largest remaining power, I think, in the, in the system. And uh, unfortunately, uh, when, when the Congress is of the same party uh, as we had during Bush and as we now have during Obama with a different party in power, uh, you don't really have anybody saying to the president, oh, well, I don't think your little gems are all that shiny, you know. So you do need, you do need pushback from other people. And I think the system has been damaged to some extent. And, that, uh, uh, and I think that system worked to restrain government in the early years of the republic and probably up into the 20th century. But I think uh, after that, the system was weakened. So it, it's, it, I don't think there's much restraint anymore. One thing I might just add, and then I'll, I'll get to Bill's question. Um, one thing I think to keep in mind is the founders were uh, almost without exception um, motivated by a certain uh, worldview uh, which was called natural law. And the natural law view uh, is inspired in many respects by the golden rule. Um, and the view is, uh, getting back to some of Andy's quotes he was pointing out, is that the, um, the view that the, the l'etat et moi, uh, that I am the state, I can say, make up my own rules, is to say I defy the natural law. I defy this, this objective standard of morality. And so I do think that the key is that if a critical mass of the public were to say, yes, there are certain standards of behavior of morality that we insist people to adhere to, and we will not accept that in government, that's when things will change. Yes, I agree essentially with both of you, but I, I'm a little curious, Ivan, if you could tell me why you rank Washington so highly. Um, and along the lines of what Professor Rutten said, it seems to me there's something here involved more than the presidency, even before there is a presidency. If we go to the American Revolution, the first thing virtually the Americans do in, uh, when the revolution is essentially under duress in New England is launch an offensive attack against Canada. 
uh, Benedict Arnold, General Montgomery, we get defeated in that. But suppose we had won early on. We would have then been faced with the first American occupation of a foreign power uh, by this Protestant co confederation as the Canadians viewed it. Then, before the revolution is even over, in the so-called duress of 1781 in the South, where Washington finally frees up his quartermaster general, his most brilliant general, General Green, to go south and win, he sends Lafayette north to persuade the militia, whom Washington dislikes intensely, to launch an attack on Canada. And Ethan Allen calls his bluff and says, sure, we'll go. We just want three things, double pay, double ration, and plunder. And Lafayette says, I can't authorize that. So you already see these imperial centralizing tendencies before there is a United States under uh, the, the uh, Constitution. And then once he's in power, Washington in 1792 gives $726,000 to support the Creoles in Haiti against the revolution there. Of course, counting his wife's slaves, he's the biggest slaveholder in the American colonies, and uh, that's a lot of money. I'd like to see it compared to today's money. But he, clearly he is not a non-interventionist. He's, he's a unilateral interventionist. And that's all done before he, what Professor Cohen says, murders the militia system by the time of the Whiskey Rebellion. So how can you rate him so highly? <laughs> <laughs> Well, first of all, I'd like to say that it's Bill, a by the way, likes the book. So. <laughs> Joe, I'd hate to he see does. a book he, he hated. He <laughs> um, uh, first of all, I didn't. Ra ra I specifically didn't rank Madison, Jefferson, and Washington on what they did before uh, the system was designed. I rated them only as presidents. Uh, Madison. I, Madison and Jefferson would be rated much higher as Americans, I think, than as presidents. Um, George Washington uh, might get a lower rating, but uh, my two um, main reasons is that uh, Washington uh, is regarded by some people who are um, who really like Jefferson as a Federalist, and I think he was a Federalist towards the end of his uh, second term, uh, well, probably in his second term. And, uh, but I think you have to give George Washington a couple of um, uh, credits. Uh, first of all, he was so admired that, uh, you know, he won two unanimous uh, electoral college ballots for president. And he could have been a lot more powerful than he was. And he didn't go along with all of and Alexander Hamilton's uh, uh, executive branch fantasies. And uh, he certainly wasn't a king. He wasn't a dictator. And he did have Republican tendencies, I think. And, uh, and, the, and this, this is going to seem like I'm being flipped, but I'm actually serious about this. Uh, George Washington, uh, his greatest achievement was leaving office. Think about it. I mean, he could have stayed, uh, and that was a tremendous thing because in Europe, uh, that's what the problem was: monarchs, or, or you have a person like Napoleon who's not a monarch but becomes a dictator, takes over, and uh, he that that two-term limit, that tradition was so strong that it lasted until Roosevelt broke it uh, uh, prior to World War II. Uh, for and I. It was only a tradition. It was not in the Constitution. Right. right. But, and, and after that, uh, the tradition was still so great that they passed a constitutional uh, amendment that says you can't do that anymore. You can have two terms. But, uh, so I think that was a very important uh, precedent. And many presidents were tempted to go away from that precedent. And they didn't because of what Washington, Washington's memory was revered. And so I think uh, you have to give uh, credit. Uh, remember that the United States was a, a republic uh, that had never been tried in a large area, and uh, uh, there had been other republics throughout world history, but this was sort of a unique experiment, and it could have failed. And I think uh, Washington was at least, uh, uh, should be given some credit for uh, 
um, kicking it off. And I think the Whiskey Rebellion, he, he acted improperly in that. And he, he also had other improper. I, I rank him, I think, seventh is what I gave him. So I don't think he should be in the top three presidents or the top four, which would, I suppose, actually remove him from Mount Rushmore. So he might as well just remove them all. But, <laughs> but, anyway, but anyway, I rank him seventh. And I think uh, some of that is because he did have Republican tendencies and he did kind of get, get the system kicked off. There was still a monarch party until 1833 yeah. in the United States. Could I, could, before I, you're next. Could I ask you to just indicate who the worst presidents were? <laughs> yeah. All right, I better read this off the book here so I don't get it wrong. <laughs> By the way, one thing I should mention, what I, Ivan did, is that um, each president has its own chapter, and there's, there's specs on that particular president, his, his party, and other background information. Um, and also, what he did is he ranks them on these three criteria, and he signed a numerical score, and then you tabulate that. And um, people of goodwill will have differences about these things. <clears throat> but it's quite, I, I mean, I, I have to really underscore what Andy, Andy was saying, was that it's really a very powerful way to get people to think about moral principle, which is what we're talking about. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read 30 to 40. Richard Nixon, FDR, Lyndon Johnson, George H.W. Bush, Ronald Reagan, John F. Kennedy, George W. Bush, James Polk, William McKinley, Harry S. Truman, and Woodrow Wilson. And some people have actually taken me to task saying, well, George W. Bush is the, should be the worst. And I say, well, you know, we often look at history through uh, current policy eyes. That's why Woodrow Wilson and Harry Truman have been rehabilitated. But I think uh, uh, the uh, James Polk, William McKinley, Harry S. Truman, and Woodrow Wilson, uh, what they have in common is they all started wars which had bigger ramifications than the war in Iraq, as, as bad as the war in Iraq is. And there's certainly negative uh, uh, implications for that. But I think those other four presidents started wars that have had uh, much greater implications for the country. OK, Carl, the gentleman here. I understand why you would want to apply the same three criteria throughout history. However, in 220 years, there's been a lot of changes in the world. And is it now a risk? Uh, I'm just going to take two of them. Restraining foreign policy. Uh, you, I haven't read your book, so I may not do justice to the way you use that. But we are in an interdependent, interconnected world. How, how can we uh, afford to be not restrained, but not intervening? at this time in the world? That's, that's my question. But the, 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 other, the other one is less government. Uh, you know, 220 years ago, they were not corporations. We had budgets bigger than some states in the world. So how do you deal with that? Uh, uh, in other words, uh, taking into account the evolution of the world, does it make so, some of these criteria possibly a little bit biased? as you go forward, and more ideological than really practical? Well, first of all, I don't think, in many ways, the world is more interdependent in communication and transportation. But in the security area, I would argue that it's probably less interdependent. Nuclear weapons have uh, cut cross-border aggression. has been declining in the last few decades. Most of the wars that we have now are civil wars, internal wars, which really don't threaten the U.S. security. The founders realized this back in the, uh, and we, our modern presidents don't seem to figure this out. Uh, we have a tremendous, a tremendously good security situation here. We have Britain, the reason uh, freedom uh, came about in Britain is because they didn't need big armies. They had a big navy, they had the best navy in the world, but navies don't oppress people, armies do. And that's why they're an island and they had that moat. And it wasn't always effective because the Normans invaded in 1066, et cetera. But for the most part, it was effective. Well, we have huge moats. Uh, there's no nation that has ever been able to uh, cross those except the United States itself during World War II and uh, launch, or we never really launched the amphibious invasion against the Japan, but we were poised to. We island hopped all the way over, and it's very difficult to do. And uh, there's no power now that can do it. And we have weak and friendly neighbors. And now, what the founders didn't have in their time is we have the most robust nuclear arsenal on the planet. We got all these alliances at exactly the time we didn't need them. There's no country that's going to conventionally attack us because we'll incinerate them. 
And uh, and if we, I mean, we could we could have no arm. We we need a, a the Coast Guard and these nuclear weapons, these submarines that go under the sea are the most powerful weapons ever devised by man. And the Navy, I've been on them, and the Navy will tell you that they have eight times the kill power of all the ordnance in World War II. Now I don't. I think we ought to reduce nuclear weapons, but nuclear weapons have made cross-border aggression uh, have diminished. And I'm not a proponent of nuclear weapons. The second thing is. Uh, nationalism has become so great that you run into the problems that we've had in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, it's not, and you're assuming that a lot of these um, interventions work. Since 1900, the U.S. has tried 17 uh, campaigns to uh, bring democracy to countries. Two are still outstanding, Iraq and Afghanistan. Four were successful. They were all first world European countries, and the other 11 have failed. So this, this, these ideas that interventions are going to be successful is another thing. So number one, I think the world is not necessarily more interdependent security-wise, and number two, uh, these interventions are not successful. Now as far as is the, the argument, I think the, the other argument that you're making is that society has become so complex that we need a big government to manage it all. But I say if the, the bigger the society is, the more the government has, it will do the wrong thing. So perhaps, uh, you know, we can debate that, but that's, that's my view, because um, if things are so complex, the, the government, it's like if you take the extreme, the Soviet Union, they didn't manage their c complex society very well at all. And so freedom, I think, is better than that sort of thing, and people making their own decisions in their own interest many times, uh, to the extent that we can do that, is, 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 is better in a complex society because the government just can't keep up with it. By the way, one thing I should mention is that one of the big influences on uh, people like Jefferson uh, as far as understanding economics was written uh, work by an economist whose name is uh, Destute de Tracy and who is a free market economist and was a critic of central planning. And uh, this was a, it wasn't just that view that this natural law idea was an ethical view, but it had practical reality. It was of something that really was ingrained in reality and you can't defy it without paying consequences. And in the 20th century, of course, as, as many, some of you may know, uh, economists like Ludwig von Mises and F.A. Hayek and others showed essentially that socialism inherently fails because it, it's confronted with an economic calculation problem. And that's why socialist societies do so poorly. So what Ivan is, is referring to is, is sort of this um, almost like a vanity that, someone, that people believe that they can somehow control people's lives. One thing I was going to point out, this is Ivan's book on the question that you asked, The Empire Has No Clothes and I'd highly recommend it. The other thing I, um, I was going to show you is a book that Carl Close, who's sitting here, is a co-editor of called The Posey and the Crusader State, which is a look at um, especially the contemporary view of interventionism based on the uh, approach that Woodrow Wilson um, made sort of enshrined. It was He wasn't the first person, McKinley and others, but it sort of became an enshrined view. and. Uh, one good, great thing about this book also is there's a whole section <clears throat> of the book on the on the failure of nation building. Uh, so, um, one of the things I think that allows us to do the nation building is the existence of the Federal Reserve or a national bank. And I remember Jackson was, I think, one of the good guys, or at least one of the things he did is he got rid of the central bank back in his time. But Wilson brought it back. And can you comment on the effect of having a you know, a cartel of bankers get together and get in cahoots with the federal government as to how that increases the power of the government and makes us the interventionist that we are sometimes. Well, that relates to your rating of Martin Van Buren, right? Right. I rate Martin Van Buren highly because he had, he had uh, and I think Jeff Hummel, who's a, a fellow at our institute, uh, would agree with this. He thinks Martin Van Buren is the greatest president of all time. I rate him down uh, slightly because well, I rank him third because he, his Indian policies were pretty bad, but that's a different subject. But he, and he, he had this free market banking system, which lasted up until the creation of the Federal Reserve. And the Federal Reserve, um, uh, I think, really has caused a lot of inflation. And you're absolutely right. Uh, it's, it, the government is in cahoots with the bankers. And I think you see it even goes beyond the Federal Reserve, and you see a lot of uh, subsidies towards bank, uh, banking. And we're seeing this now because banks are 
uh, regarded as the circulatory system of the economy, and they're so important that no bank can fail. And, and the big banks uh, are even more immune because they know that they're too big to fail. The, uh, they're the biggest people, they're the biggest entities in a vital industry, as with vital uh, with quotes around the vital. So I think uh, bankers do have a special place in our society. And unfortunately, I think we're victims of that right now because they won't let the, some banks fail that made bad decisions. If you don't do allow that, you're going to have another banking crisis. That this crisis didn't stem from uh, under regulation. I think that it stemmed from uh, the downside risk to banks has been ameliorated by the government programs, FDIC and other uh, you know, uh, what you're talking about, the cozy relationship between the government and the bankers. Yes. We have a question. Oh, time for one more quick question. Yes, you have not mentioned the actually the fourth power in the state, which is the bureaucracy. How much does the bureaucracy influence the way we are going? Uh, I feel it is getting very strong, and I'm afraid that uh, our our bureaucrats become the mandarins, which eventually sank the Chinese Empire. Well, that came out in your discussion with Ron Paul on the interview on afterward where you were talking about, the two of you were talking about um, there have been fewer bills passed since 1993 and yet you have all these you know congressional you know the federal register and all this other stuff yes well he pointed out that that might be a bad thing uh, because the uh, the bureaucracy is sort of on autopilot and doesn't get uh, the congressional input from the people and uh, the oversight uh, it certainly doesn't get the oversight that's needed. But I think uh, we're not quite to the point of Japan where the bureaucracy actually runs the country. But I think, you know, the, your point is a valid one, is the, uh, this massive executive branch and that you've got the president up here and he only knows so much. He's got his people uh, at the top of every department, a few people uh, that are on his team. But how much do they really know what's going on with these massive departments? I mean, certainly Gates at the Defense Department is a classic example of a guy who I think is probably trying to do the right thing now, or at least move towards that. But he's got this massive five, five service bureaucracies and a bunch of other agencies, and it's this huge complex. And even if he has the best of intentions, he can't get the, the beast to, to move in the way he wants it or only do so very slowly. And this is, this is not just in the Defense Department, but all over the, all over the um, the government. And so I think you're absolutely right. And that's the danger uh, that the people, uh, you know, this idea that the government of the people, by the people, and for the people is the biggest fraudulent statement that anybody ever made, I think, because it may have, may have been more true, certainly in Lincoln's time, but I think Lincoln did a certain amount to make it not true, actually. But, uh, but it certainly isn't true anymore. I mean, if you have to ever deal with a federal bureaucracy on anything, I mean, you realize that. Uh, this is your government that's doing this to you, right? So I think, uh, you know, certainly the bureaucracy is a big problem. No, we have the DHS. Mm. Um, I want to thank our two speakers, Ivan uh, and, and Andy. Um, <laughs> the real, this is the real star of the evening. And I want to especially thank Ivan for, this was a huge project. And in the audience, I want to point out Anthony Gregory, who is <clears throat> here, policy analyst at the Independent Institute, <clears throat> who worked with Ivan. Um, but this is Ivan's book, and uh, we're very proud of it. But Anthony deserves a lot of credit. An He's Anthony did an enormous amount of research for it. Um, so Um, I hope that you'll pick up a copy. I'm sure I would be delighted to autograph it. And thank you for coming and making your evening so successful. We look forward to seeing you next time. Good night. <laughs>